Hello everybody, back here, Bullion here, coming to you with part two of the interview with the Assay Office, the Edinburgh Assay Office. It has been a really, really interesting discussion uh, with Scott here, the head of the Assay Office. If you haven't checked out part one, that's probably the best place to start. There's a link down in the description below. We've got a lot to get through, so let's just crack on. Scott, what on earth have we got here on the table? Because this certainly does not look like your regular piece of jewellery that you might expect coming out of the assay office. This piece here um, is what's called an, an assay piece. And as if you've seen part one, you'll remember that the assay office uh, began as a trade guild. Um, uh, the assay office is a separate entity um, run by that trade guild. Um, meant that the trade guild could continue to do its job of ensuring that the standards of silversmithing and goldsmithing, which included uh, uh, gold and silver content uh, and hallmark, uh, could continue. But they didn't limit themselves to gold content. It was, of course, the skills. Yeah. So at one time, we would have had apprentices that were indentured, that's a term, indentured to the incorporation of goldsmiths, and at the end of their apprenticeship, they would be uh, asked to produce what's called an assay piece. And that was the end of a six year period, they would produce a piece that, that, that showcased their skills. And on the basis of that piece, the uh, incorporation of goldsmiths, um, which runs the assay office, would say yay or nay on whether they were actually a silversmith. So it was about the quality of the craftsmanship. Yeah, and I can imagine this chap past with this he fantastic he goblet. Did. This is absolutely amazing. So Scott, I, I, you probably don't know, but I run a, a weekly series on my YouTube channel called In Focus Friday, where I take something and put it up close to my camera and have a good old look at it. And this would be the crown jewel on that. So uh, you guys have got a special treat here to have a look at this. And, and there, in fact, are all of the hallmarks that go on it. So that is a really amazing Piece. So that's kind of 18, 1800s. And an uh, old, old piece as well. It's but the incorporation, which, which runs the assay office, continues to support the trade. So this uh, piece, which is quite unusual, it's very is, unusual. Is, is part of a collection uh, called Silver of the Stars. So the in incorporation put 10 silversmiths from Scotland with 10 Scottish celebrities and asked them to design a a drinking vessel uh, around the subject, a drink with a close friend. Mm. Now this particular piece uh, was produced by a young um, Edinburgh based maker who was paired with Billy Connolly. Sir Billy Connolly now. Indeed Sir, Billy, Sir Connolly. Billy Connolly. And this was produced uh, around his love of tea yeah. uh, and around his love of his trike. So you can see it's a teapot which lifts away and, and there is you have... trike and in fact here is there's a hallmark on the teapot spout yes. which would be difficult to get on camera but there's also a plaque here with the hallmark as well that's and made up like a number plate and that's and Billy Connolly's signature which has been uh, engraved and that, in and that is absolutely fantastic looks and that also pretty comes, special if I can move that on fortunately it moves quite nicely yeah and we can bring in the uh, the sugar bowl which is exactly the same um, I don't know if you can see the long front forks, but yep. around the back you have the same number plate, which is here, but you also have a banjo, which is the spoon for the sugar. Brilliant. Which I think is fantastic, fantastic. stuff. So this is just a really eclectic, different type of piece that the Edinburgh Assay Office can mark and do, and, and really I suppose the sky's the limit with, with what can be marked and what you know, what you can well, I th have. I, th I think that the, the, the important point I would make here is that the Assay Office is, is, is and, and the incorporation of goldsmiths of the City of Edinburgh are one and the same. Mm. So our function as an Assay Office is, is, is important, but we are a not-for-profit organisation. Any profits that are generated go back in to projects like this which support the trade. So it's a virtuous circle. So yep. the fantastic thing about hallmarking is it's not government funded. Yeah. If you don't buy jewellery, you don't pay for it. Yeah. If you buy jewellery, you pay a small amount of money yeah. for the hallmark. And any any surplus that we have goes back into supporting the art and the craft yeah. that we originally set out to support. It's brilliant. So it's a it's it's a great story. Uh, and every time you buy something that's hallmarked, you're supporting young 
uh, up and coming silversmiths and goldsmiths and, and, and tomorrow's skills. Indeed. Well, one day it would be a feat of my own engineering if I was to be able to do something quite like this. I'm not sure that's ever going to happen in my skill level with the humble old hand poured silver which I do. But that is, that's a really amazing thing to, to see, so thank you for that. Now, I want to move on to, uh, we've got a whole bunch of user, um, I say user, community driven questions, community submitted questions, that's the phrase I was after, um, to get you to answer, Scott. So these have, these have come from the Silver Forum members who uh, are represented here by this little Silver Forum round. First of all then, do you get much hand poured silver? We've seen uh, a slight increase in the last two or three years. You know, quite a lot of uh, uh, the, there are quite a few people that are doing it. We have uh, two or three customers that are hand pouring their own. And it's uh, it's I mean it's incredibly popular in the United States, the hand poured silver market, and it's certainly not one which is very common here in the UK. But uh, it is on the up and coming, I think. And yeah. I would encourage any of you out there who, uh, who are doing some hand poured silver in the UK, uh, certainly from a legal perspective, to have a look about hallmarking, because if you're making some silver articles which uh, would not constitute just bullion, then you have a requirement to get hallmarks put on them. But also, it really does add a lot of value to your items and that kind of, we talked about it in part one, about the, uh, you know, the authenticity, the guarantee that comes with that. Uh, so that's very, very important. In terms of, um, hallmarking silver like this. We've had a question from a, uh, a community member saying, could I, as Backyard Bullion, submit a piece of unhallmarked silver that I did not make and have my marks put on it or just generally get it assayed, even if my mark wasn't going on it, but could I do that in theory? Um, if you're in the course of trader business, mm -hmm. then you're required to register. So your mark here, Backyard Bullion, yeah let's anyone trace this back to you. You're yeah. responsible for it and we're responsible for the standard of silver. So if, if you weren't registered and you were a member of the public, we have our own EEO mark which can be used. Yeah. Um, but we reserve that literally for members of the public who've had, who have a one-off yeah. incident. Yeah. Uh, if you're in the course of trader business in any form, you need to register. Yeah. Now, you could submit goods not made by you uh, and you could apply your mark to them, and that would be what th these terms, th these marks. Once upon a time, were called makers' marks because they meant that someone had made it. Yeah. In this day and age, um, there's a lot of product which is made by a third party, and it's it, it's it's produced um, with the company's mark on it, yeah. and that's why more commonly this is known as a sponsor's mark. I was going to say exactly that's a sponsor's mark, so it'd be almost like I suppose. I would be sponsoring the piece that yes. somebody sent me and I'd be saying, okay, I'm confident that it is what it is. But you are the person that I'm that's traced back to. So obviously if, if somebody submitted something to me and it ended up getting a fail on its assay testing, then that's impacting me and my reputation with you guys and generally as well. So yes, I can. Whether I would or not is another question entirely. Right, jumping into another community question. Um, have you ever come across a piece with a hallmark that is uh, a counterfeit? So presumably it wouldn't take that skilled a CNC machinist to machine engineer some assay marks which look identical to your marks. Well, the, the answer to that is yes. Um, we have come across fakes. Um, we can always tell mm -hmm. um, because obviously every punch that's made by us uh, is recorded on a plate sure, uh, and we can magnify that plate to a hundred times so we know exactly they're all made from the same masses so we can tell yeah. whether a mark is our mark by yeah. measuring dimensions so here's a classic example what we have here is a fake mark you can see there so if we, you can let, see that. let's bring it up here close to the camera so we have an Edinburgh fake mark here uh, and what happened with this particular piece? So here's the fake marks underneath there. You can see they've been stamped and they've been stamped quite heavily through. You can see on the other oh, side. Oh gosh, yeah. So, so what happened through. here was this was bought by a, an antique dealer um, on eBay and he thought it was a bit rough, went to polish it and found a, a brassy coppery colour underneath. Oh dear. Got in Not touch with sign. us. We, we, we received it, tested it, confirmed it was a fake. 
he, with his help and a number of other people who had bought from the same account on eBay, we discovered there was a full range of products which were bearing our mark, which were being made in Turkey. They were very bad marks. They looked very obvious to us that they weren't our mark, but they had been yeah. made with punches which had been fake. Now, fake punches carry a 10-year prison sentence uh, wow. as, as far okay. as the hallmarking act is concerned. So I joined police uh, in Newcastle on a raid. Uh, we traced the premises yeah. and we found a huge amount of product all wrapped in Turkish newspaper. Wow. And the chap went to court and uh, the, uh, went to prison yeah, as well. the court did its job. That's um, absolutely fascinating. That's something I did not know and that's uh, pretty, pretty amazing, really. So we keep these now in our black museum. Um, just for occasions as, like this. Uh, as examples of, of what not to do. So there you go, that's... Very, very bad marks, and, and in this case, very easy for us to identify as fake. But sadly, not so easy for Joe Public to identify if you were out there. And uh, unfortunately, in a sort of flea market situation, or even like the likes of eBay, and, uh, and if you were to be unlucky enough to pick that up, then you are going to be out of pocket, which would, is a shame. I would say at this point, I mean, uh, hallmarking is designed for point of sale. Mm. So it's that first point of sale. So it's the first encounter with the consumer. After that, once you're into the second hand market, hallmarking is useful, but at that stage, the person that's selling it isn't responsible for it. It's, yep. uh, you know, all sorts of things can happen. And I think hallmarking is always best at point of sale. Brilliant. Uh, when it's a new item, um, because things can happen after the event. Right then, so uh, let's follow on from the fake hallmarking question to another community question, which is something we kind of touched on briefly um, in an earlier question. How much would it cost for a member of the public to send in an item that they might have, or they might have found, for example, if they were metal detecting, uh, for some analysis from the Edinburgh Assay Office, and would you be able to put a hallmark on it? Um, I, yes, we, 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 can, we can do a single uh, alloy analysis, a single uh, element analysis. So if you want to know how much gold is in something, how much silver is in something, we can do that, and it's uh, 25 pounds yep. uh, plus five. Uh, if you want to have something hallmarked, um, there are minimum charges which are starting at around fifteen pounds. Yeah, so definitely possible. Um, yes. And do do you get that much? Do you, do you have a lot of members of the public? No, we don't. We, we don't actually. And, and and I guess we are a B two B organisation. Mm -hmm. We're, we we do deal with the public. Uh, we give a lot of advice um, to uh, trading standards and and to directly to consumers when they find themselves in a situation where they need guidance on what the law is and what their rights are. Yeah. Um, but none of that uh, uh, is paid for. That's all part of our uh, altruistic uh, uh, duty to the consumer. Um, but testing, when our lab is required to do a test, yeah, there is a, a, a charge. But if you consider, if you were to go to a um, another test lab that wasn't an assay office, you'd be looking at probably about £200 for that test. Crikey, okay. So. Not necessarily worth it if you've just found a small silver ring out in the field, but no. at least it could theoretically be done and, uh, and give a bit of peace of mind for somebody. Uh, maybe if you've found a piece of very old jewellery from a foreign country, perhaps, that you don't know anything about, for example. Um, right, last question from a community member is, uh, what happens if the Edinburgh Assay Office makes a mistake whilst marking something? Uh, and I have a little bit of experience with that because we had a small issue roughly this time last year, I think it was, um, and we talked a little bit about that in a separate video. I'll put a link down in the description. I don't really think we need to rehash that, but it's an interesting question from this community member. Do mistakes happen? And if they do, what's, what's the sort of process? And how, do you, how do you guys handle it? Sure. I think, first of all, um, sometimes there's confusion about expectation. If we deal with a manufacturer, we expect a manufacturer to be able to... Uh, if you want a deep mark which is struck, you're going to have some displacement. Yeah. And most manufacturers understand that. If there's a requirement for us to return something in perfect condition, and we do probably eight or 9,000 units a day, which are completely finished, ready to go into the shops, and we do that with absolute ease. If there's a mistake, a tool fails or something, then we have a full team of jewellers here. 
and we're able to contact the customer, uh, repair the piece fully uh, and return it restored. Yeah. So uh, basically we have a, almost a, ma a, a manufacturing uh, um, um, division in-house and we can, uh, we can return goods to uh, the per perfect condition. And I know that's, that's pretty much what we've been working on for my own stuff for this last couple of years, well, this last year. And it was, just to put it in context, it was all about expectations, about what I was expecting to come from some of my pieces that I'd sent in, which were finished in my eyes, but not necessarily finished from the marker's eyes. And, but now, you know, it's about that sort of customer expectation process. It is, and, 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 it's, it, and it's a learning curve. It was a learning curve for you, as I yeah. remember. Oh, totally. I mean, the thing about uh, material like this is when you displace material, you mark there. When you when you when you compress the metal to create that impression, the metal has to go somewhere. Yeah, and that's always the case. Um, and I think um, that in itself uh, is something that we have a lot of expertise in controlling. Yeah, but it's always a compromise. The deeper you go, the more displacement you exactly. Get. And obviously, the larger the mark as well. Of uh, course, you know you can get different ranging sizes of hallmarks. I've got two. Uh, we've got a smaller hallmark and a larger hallmark. But um, yeah, one thing that is, of course, really good is, as you said, there that whole range of sort of jewelry skills and craftsmen that can look to repair articles. And I know that the uh, the master marker who looks after my handful of silver, he drill tests samples of myself but then repairs them mm -hmm. and do you know what some of the pieces that come back I can't even tell where he's done the drill spot from his his work is absolutely phenomenal and I've tried plugging a few of the holes myself at home and I can't do it at all so he, he is very skilled and that's really we have, good we to have, see. Uh, we, we have uh, um, um, silver TIG welding we have uh, laser welding so yeah. we've got some apparatus certainly that, uh, beats my kitchen kit, yeah. kitchen table which I'm working out of yeah. at the moment yeah. we've got some good kit well, Scott, this has been an absolute pleasure to talk with you for all this time. It's turned into two very long parts of this interview. I hope you guys have enjoyed this too. Uh, it's been really fascinating for me. Do comment down below your thoughts on this uh, interview. If you'd like to see more of these types of things, then do let me know. Uh, Scott, have you got any final words for the Backyard Bullion viewership that you'd like to, uh, to say before we end? Yeah, what I would say is that hallmarking is a value add. And if you're going to hallmark, then make sure that you tell the story. It really is a very special thing. It's unique uh, to this industry. And what it means to the consumer is, don't just take my word for it. The reason hallmarking came about was because the Mark I eyeball cannot tell the difference between this and another white metal. Yeah. And 550 years on, guess what? You still can't tell the difference. No. It's the oldest trick in the book, and this mark gives everybody the confidence that this is the real thing. Fantastic. Well, Scott, as I said, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your time today. Guys, put a thumbs up on this video and share it around on your social media. That would be very helpful for everything I do here on my channel to continue to grow it and produce excellent content for you all. If you want to see more things like this in the future, hit the subscribe button. I will be doing other interviews with other businesses as well. I've got a few lined up over the next coming weeks. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. Hit the alarm bell if you want notifications. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. And please make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe for more.